Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Good afternoon. My name is Erwin Chemerinsky. I'm the Dean of the Law School, the University of California Berkeley School of Law. It's my great pleasure to be here today with Professor Rick Hassan, who's the Chancellor's Professor of Law and Political Science, at the University of California Irvine School of Law. We're here because Rick has written a terrific new book, Cheap Speech, How Disinformation Poisons Our Politics and How to Cure It. We want to ask Rick a number of questions about the book and talk with him about it. And then want very much to get your questions, so please be sure to send them in through the YouTube chat. Rick, I find the title of the book quite provocative when you call it cheap speech. What do you mean by cheap speech? Well, first, let me thank the Commonwealth Club for uh, putting this forum together. I would have hoped we could, by this time, be doing it in person, but hopefully next time that we're together uh, having a conversation, we'll be able to do it face to face. And thank you, Erwin, as always, for uh, agreeing to be the interlocutor here. So the term cheap speech is not mine. It's a term that originates with um, a professor at UCLA Law School named Eugene Volokh. He wrote an article uh, in the Yale Law Journal back in 1995, where he was talking about the coming information revolution. It was, it was in many ways quite a prescient uh, conversation, a uh, discussion in that piece. He talked about things like what we would now see as the rise of uh, Netflix and Spotify. He knew that what was going to happen is we were going to move from a trickle of speech, something like, uh, you know, your few local TV and radio stations and your local newspaper and a few national newspapers to a flood of information. And he knew that this was going to make intermediaries like newspapers less important. He was very optimistic about it. So what he meant by cheap speech was cheap that is inexpensive to produce and disseminate. We certainly have that world and there's certainly a lot of benefits to that world. You literally can get the knowledge in the palm of your hands with your smartphone. But I mean cheap speech in a second less positive way as well. I mean that we have, as we've eliminated intermediaries and made speech move more easily, uh, move to a world where lower valued speech, that's the other cheap speech, has an advantage over higher valued speech. And so what I mean by that is, uh, if you're a local newspaper today and you want to investigate what's happening in city hall or what's happening in county government or state government, it's very expensive to do that work. You have to pay a lot of people. It takes a lot of time and effort. And uh, you, you have to sell newspapers to get that out there. And because of the changing economics of the whole situation, local newspapers have been decimated. They don't carry classified advertising or advertising like they used to before. So it's really hard to get good information out there because people are not supporting these local newspapers. And what's happening instead is that it's very easy to spread misinformation, disinformation, opinions not backed by any facts. Uh, this is this lower valued speech, which has an advantage in the market. And voters who are trying to, and the focus of my book is on voters and elections, voters who are trying to get reliable information about what's going on with our elections or our politics are having a harder time because they don't know if what they're seeing is true or false. I mean, just this week, we saw stories about how uh, there are these false news sites. They're really propaganda outfits set up by the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, or their allies. Some, one even set up by the government of Russia to look like local news, but to give people propaganda and sometimes misinformation. And so we're in a world where the, the speech is cheap. It flows easily, but it's not necessarily what voters really would value from being able to have easy access to. A significant part of the book is detailing what you see as the problems with regard to chief speech. You just alluded to some of them, but could you elaborate more on what you see as the harms from what you call cheap speech? So uh, the book, I should say, I, I'd written a, a, a full draft of the book, and I think you had given me comments on that. Uh, and this was well over a year ago. And then after I had a first draft, 
uh, in which I warned of the dangers of disinformation about elections in particular and how it could lead to violence, we had the events of January 6, 2021, where uh, the President of the United States egged people on uh, to come to Washington, D.C. after perpetuating a kind of um, uh, incessant lie about the election being stolen. And this led to the insurrection at the Capitol, as we all know, led to the deaths of some people, 140 uh, police officers uh, injured. Uh, and I think as the news comes out, we know we came much closer to the loss of the peaceful transition of power in this country uh, than people recognized. One of the claims I make in Shape Speech is that if we had the same polarized politics of today, but the technology of the 1950s, that kind of um, uh, situation where our democracy came perilously close to ending would have been much harder to achieve. Donald Trump was able to go to Twitter over 400 times between November 3rd on election day and November 19th, less than three weeks later, to directly speak to uh, the American people and the world making his false claims about the election being stolen. That, those claims were not filtered. If, if he would have done that in the 1950s, he wouldn't have been put on TV 400 times. His claims would have been put in context. He wouldn't have just had an open mic. And now he had the open mic. And not only that, the internet allowed for people, and we know this from some documents that were released in connection with some criminal uh, investigations of January 6th, that people saw the Be Wild message come to DC and they used Facebook groups to find each other and to organize for violent political action. And so uh, one of the main problems is that, uh, that I detail in Sheep Speech is that uh, this atmosphere can create disinformation about elections, which undermines people's confidence in elections, makes it more likely that they're not going to accept election results as legitimate, they might be willing to bend the rules next time to try to even the score. They might be more willing to accept violence. And so those are you know, some of the very urgent kinds of, uh, of problems that arose. The book talks about other ones as well, such as the fact that if you're a Marjorie Taylor Greene, you're gonna have a much easier time raising money than if you're a moderate political candidate. You can go directly to voters. You don't have to rely on your political party anymore. So it's not just newspapers that have been undermined, it's political parties. So we're in a situation of high partisanship, but weak political parties, which makes room for demagogues. So these are some of the concerns that I addressed at the beginning of the book. Let me play devil's advocate for a moment. I wonder with regard to January 6th, if you're not blaming the messenger, whether the medium is really responsible. I mean, Donald Trump was going to claim that he properly won the election, even if there wasn't the internet and social media. He was gonna file all of his lawsuits and even the mainstream media was going to pick up that. And conservative media, conservative talk radio was certainly gonna get the message for him. I wonder if you can blame the medium for Donald Trump and for those who wanted to follow him. Well, so the first thing I'd say is that my claim is not just about social media itself. Um, cable news plays a major role here, but cable news is part of the problem. That is, we don't have a Walter Cronkite anymore uh, who can tell us what the truth is, and we can believe him because he's abiding by journalistic ethics. So it's not just um, that there's social media, it's that we have partisan political media that uh, I think is in a kind of feedback loop with social media, amplifying the false claims. And I think it would have been much harder for Donald Trump to have organized people and for those people to have found each other. And so uh, right now today, there are uh, millions of people in the United States who believe that the 2020 election was stolen. I've been studying elections for more than two decades. Uh, I looked very closely at the 2020 election. There's no reason to believe there's any credible evidence that the results of the presidential election were different than those that were reported anywhere else. And yet, not only do vast majorities of Republicans believe the election was stolen, in part because Trump was able to you know, repeatedly spread these messages, but also a CNN poll in September found that 59% of uh, Republican voters say that believing the false claim that the 2020 election is stolen is an important part of what it means to be a Republican. I don't think that those kinds of messages were, would have been as likely to resonate 
without the ability to spread these kinds of lies unchecked and unfiltered. Let me play devil's advocate in another way as well. Your book very much focuses on the harms of cheap speech. These were things you were just talking about. But what about all the benefits of cheap speech? In some ways, we're in the golden age of freedom of speech, that it used to be in order to reach a mass audience, you had to be rich enough to own a newspaper, get a broadcast license. Now we've really democratized the ability to reach a mass audience. Anyone with a smartphone or access to a modem can do so. As you alluded to earlier, there's the ability to access unlimited information just from our phones. Why believe that the harms of cheap speech outweigh these benefits? So I don't think you need to claim that the harms outweigh the benefits. I think you just need to recognize that there are significant harms. And I do recognize that there are great benefits. If you think about George Floyd and the racial justice movement, the ability to post videos of uh, police acting in ways that are illegal and immoral, that helped to galvanize a movement too, that helped people to organize. And I'm not saying the bad outweighs the good overall. What I'm saying is that, that what's happened has created uh, a challenge to our elections. And so I know we're gonna turn to solutions later, but I think it's important to point out now because the day after my book came out, there were headlines at both Fox News and the Daily Mail saying professor calls for censorship. And they obviously not read my book. Uh, because the only speech that I argue in the book that should be limited are lies about when, where, and how people vote, which the Supreme Court in a 2018 case said is perfectly acceptable to limit, uh, and we can talk about that, and foreign spending, which the Supreme Court has said on elections, which the Supreme Court has said is perfectly willing to limit. What I want to do is give voters tools to be able to get access to more valuable information. So we don't have to, to accept that, the, that there are many problems with how uh, voters get information. We don't have to agree that the bad outweighs the good. We just have to see that there are significant negative outcomes. As I say in the book, I don't think any of us would wanna go back to a time where if you don't like what the New York Times prints, your only option really to get the word out is to send a letter to the editor of the New York Times and just hope that it among hundreds of others would be printed. It's great that we can get uh, additional conversations going, but it's a double-edged sword because it also invites the kind of dangers that we've been talking about. I think it would be good to transition to talking about your solutions. And as we look at them, think about, are you right? Will they make the situation better or might it make it worse? Just for those who are watching, I'm Erwin Chemerinsky from Berkeley Law. I have the great pleasure of talking to Rick Hassan, the Chancellor's Professor of Law and Political Science at University of California, Irvine and foremost expert on election law in the United States. What I especially liked about the book, Rick, is how detailed you are with regard to the potential solutions. Well, let me get some of them. You say change election administration. It's the first one that you talk about in the book. What do you mean? Well, so the first thing I should say, just to frame it, is that I believe that there are changes in the law that would make things better, but that changes in the law are not enough even if we get everything enacted that I propose, which is you know, a long shot, and even if the Supreme Court accepted everything I said, which is, uh, I think, doubtful given the current Supreme Court, it still wouldn't be enough. So when I talk about solutions, you have to uh, recognize that uh, this is a multifaceted problem. It requires multifaceted solutions. No one, there's no one magic bullet to deal with these kinds of problems. And I, I do recognize that it's kind of odd in a book that's focused on speech to talk about how elections are run. And what I mean there is that um, one way to take the fuel out of the, the fire is to run elections in, in a fair way. And so there are some people who are going to be convinced and want to be convinced that the 2020 election was stolen. But there are a larger number of people in the middle who say, OK, if that's your claim, as, as the courts did, show me your evidence. And so if you run a sloppy election, and I've written uh, two earlier books, uh, one called Election Meltdown, one called The Voting Wars, where I point out that when you have slack in election administration, when elections are administered poorly, uh, then there's room to claim fraud and it becomes more plausible when you hear about people forgetting to count ballots or uh, you know, people not sent ballots, those kinds of things. So I do think fair election administration is a really important first step uh, to at least help those in the middle who want to look at the election and figure out uh, you know, was it run in a fair way or not? And, and let me give one very specific example here to, to make this concrete. Uh, 
You may remember that uh, one of Donald Trump's claims was that the election was stolen from him in Georgia. And he made a call to the Secretary of State of Georgia, Brad Raffensperger, Republican, a call that Brad Raffensperger recorded and later released, in which Trump asked for uh, Raffensperger to, quote, find 11,780 votes. And Raffensperger says, there's no way I'm going to do that. And that was the end of the conversation. Um, but they did a full hand recount of every ballot in uh, the state. And they were able to say that within a few hundred votes, because there's always some slack, the results that were announced were, were correct, that Biden had won the state. Imagine if Georgia was still using voting machines that were wholly electronic, that didn't produce a piece of paper. And so all you had was software. You push a button and it says, this is the vote total. Just imagine the kinds of conspiracy theories about uh, elections being hacked that would have flown. So one way to deal with election disinformation is use sound principles of election administration, like always have a piece of paper that a court or another body could count to tell us what the truth is. Having a physical, tangible piece of paper, that's what we need for our elections because of the lack of trust, even if those electronic voting machines work well. It's a great point. I just want to focus on election administration for a moment. There have been a lot of changes since November 2020 with regard to election administration. Do you want to speak about those and whether they're going in the right or wrong direction? Well, so one concern that I bracket in the book is concerns about voter suppression, laws that make it harder for people to register or vote. Those earlier books that I mentioned talk about those issues, and I'm very concerned about them. Today, though, I, I have an even greater concern about election subversion, which is the risk that the winner of the election won't be declared the winner. And I have a piece coming out that we'll post next week at the Harvard Law Review website talking about how to minimize the risk to that. So that's kind of tangential to my project in cheap speech. But I am very concerned, not only about laws that make it harder for people to register and vote for no good reason, but also laws that potentially make it easier to manipulate election results. And so one of the things that I'm worried about is uh, Raffensperger, who I just mentioned, he's in a primary election facing a member of Congress named Jody Heiss, who's a Republican congressman who has embrace the, the lie that the 2020 election was stolen. He may be the one running elections in Georgia in 2024, if it's Biden versus Trump too. And let's say that Heist runs a completely fair election and announces that Trump has won. Are people on the left actually going to believe him? I think the kind of doubts about election integrity that we see on the right that were fomented by Trump are going to boomerang. And we're actually going to have people on the left start having the same kind of doubts. So really having fair rules, having transparency, having good election administration makes it harder for elections to be stolen, but also harder to lie about elections being stolen. I want to go through several of your other proposals, but I do want to pause and remind everyone, please put your questions in the YouTube chat and we'll get to the questions pretty soon. Really look forward to getting your questions. Rick, another proposal you have is for greater disclosure. As you know better than anyone, efforts to impose greater disclosure with regard to campaign finance reform have been unsuccessful since Citizens United versus FEC in 2010. The Disclose Act never made it through Congress. Why believe that disclosure laws here are any more likely to be adopted? Well, first, let me talk about why I think disclosure is a good solution. So uh, our election laws are outdated, as you mentioned. So today, if an ad says um, Joe Biden is a true leader and it's run close to the election, and you see that ad on TV, and you see that ad come through either your cable box or a satellite like DirecTV, that ad is subject to certain disclosure rules under a law that passed 20 years ago this week called the McCain-Feingold Law. Uh, on the other hand, if you're watching that same TV ad, and it comes to you through Hulu or YouTube TV, which are not cable or satellite, that ad is not subject to disclosure. Similarly, if the ad appears on Facebook, that is not subject to uh, disclosure unless it expressly calls for the election or defeat of a candidate. That's a nonsensical system. As more and more of our speech gets to us through the internet, our campaign finance rules need to be updated. And this is what I mean when I said, I'm not for censorship. What I'm for is calling for voters getting more information. And so if voters know that, you know, that person on Facebook 
who claims to be an African-American voter and is trying to convince me not to vote for Hillary Clinton because she hasn't done enough for the black community, that turns out to be a Russian government agent, as we saw in 2016, or to take a, a case on the other side of the political aisle in 2017, supporters of Doug Jones, who was running as the Democratic candidate for senator in Alabama, not Jones himself, he had nothing to do with this, but supporters of his targeted ads at moderate Republicans, telling them that Roy Moore, his Republican opponent, um, that he might want to support banning of alcohol in the state. These were, were people were posing as Baptist teetotalers. I think that both the African-American voters in 2016 and the moderate Republicans in 2017, both of whom were targets to have their votes suppressed, would have benefited from knowing who was actually speaking to them. So disclosure is important, not only because it can prevent corruption and help enforce other laws like foreign uh, laws against foreign interference in elections. They're also important because they provide valuable information to voters. And until recently, the Supreme Court has been very uh, willing to uphold disclosure laws. Even the very conservative Justice Antonin Scalia was a big believer in disclosure laws and said that people should stand up for themselves. But now, as you mentioned, we have two problems. Number one, this has become yet another partisan issue, and Republicans no longer support campaign finance disclosure the way they used to, at least the Republicans in Congress. And so it is doubtful that we're going to get an improved disclosure law. This is something that the Democrats have tried to include in some of their bills, like the For the People Act. But because of the filibuster requirements and because senators like uh, Joe Manchin, uh, a more conservative Democrat, are not willing to change the filibuster requirements, it's unlikely the laws will get through. But even if miraculously they do get through, I'm concerned because the Supreme Court in the most recent disclosure case called Americans for Prosperity Foundation versus Bonta back in July, indicated that there is uh, much more skepticism at the Supreme Court about disclosure uh, because of you know not just a danger of particular people being chilled from speaking, which the Supreme Court has long recognized could provide a reason to give a, an exemption from disclosure, but that the concern about chilling could justify striking down disclosure laws as a whole. And that's very concerning. To me. And indeed, many disclosure laws, especially in the campaign finance area, that have held previously are now being challenged in light of the Americans for Prosperity case. Yes. I want to go through so many of your proposals. Let me skip to one that may have led to those headlines you described. You say, and I'm quoting, and this is a label, you want a narrow ban on empirically verifiable false election speech. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so this takes a little explaining. So most speech in elections is not about how the election itself is run. So my, my opponent has voted to raise taxes 10 times. That's a kind of, I would call that campaign speech. And I don't believe that the government has any business telling people um, that they can't say what they want to say, even if it's a lie about an opposing candidate. If it becomes defamatory, then maybe that can be dealt with by the candidate after the election. But I don't think the government can come in and say, don't say that. Um, but there's a very narrow class of cases where people lie about when, where, and how people vote. Uh, you need ID to vote in a state where you don't need ID. Democrats vote on Tuesday, Republicans vote on Wednesday. These are empirically verifiably false statements. That is, you can go to the website or the office of the local election administrator and find out what day is election day. It's Tuesday. Uh, you know, can uh, people vote without an ID, yes or no? And so if people lie about this, as the Supreme Court explained in a 2018 case called Minnesota Voter Lines versus Mansky, the government does have a compelling interest in limiting misinformation that interferes directly with the franchise. And I'll, I'll give you one example of something that happened in the 2016 election. A guy targeted uh, messages to African-American voters, telling them that they could vote by text or by social media hashtag. And they, of course, you cannot vote this way. And we know about 5,000 people tried to cast their ballots in this way. Now, he's being charged with a certain federal criminal uh, prosecution. It's not clear to me if the statute actually covers that. But what I argue in the book is that lies like that should be subject to a federal law and that such a federal law should be upheld as constitutional because it, is, it doesn't involve any government discretion. It's not like the government has to figure out how many times did the person try to uh, uh, raise taxes or get into really, you know, esoteric discussions about what do you mean by raise taxes? That was a fee. You know, it, we know what day election day is. 
So I think you can have this. The good news is I think you can pass such a law and such a law would be constitutional. The bad news is it wouldn't target most of the misinformation and disinformation we see online. And so one of the hardest cases, and I talk about in the book, is what if you lie about the last election being stolen, as Donald Trump has repeatedly done? I think it's very hard to make a claim that the same interest in protecting voters' ability to vote, right? He's not telling people, you know, go to the wrong polling place. And so you'd have to justify such a law by claiming that these statements undermine election integrity. But then if you have a law like that, what if you have an election that actually is stolen? Or there is a reasonable question about whether it's stolen. We don't want to stop people from being able to say that, raise that issue, and be able to make sure that we have a fair election. So these are really difficult questions. And so I do think that there is this very narrow place where we could help voters a little bit by keeping these lies uh, off of media and off of social media. It's a very clear explanation. Let me go to one of the other things you proposed. And I think that this is one where I'm more skeptical of constitutionality. You say you want to prohibit micro-targeting of political ads. Could you explain what micro-targeting is and how you can prohibit ads that are directed at particular people? So, so this also just requires a little bit of a technical explanation so we know what we're talking about. So micro-targeting, targeting ads at particular populations is nothing new. So, you know, uh, when I was a new voter, I, you know, remember I became a voter, the first thing I noticed was I got a lot of mail. There was a lot of, a, a lot of you know, less of that today, but, you know, more uh, ads through uh, the internet. But you get a lot of mail, and so they might use your surname, or they might use your zip code, and they're not going to write to everyone, you know, if, if you're running for a governor, you might not target the whole state, you might target people who you think you're most likely to get. I don't think that you can have a law against any of that. What I'm talking about is something different, which is today, if you're a campaign, uh, let's say you're, you're running for senator in California, and you have a list of people you want to target, people maybe who've donated to your campaign before or who have uh, called in, so you have this list, and you can give that list to Facebook, and Facebook will take it, and they will run something called their lookalike feature. And they will use the vast data that's collected about each of us when we use social media, right? So it's not just when you're on Facebook. There's a little, you know, tracker that's tracking you. Okay, you shop at this store. Uh, you belong to this church, right? There's a lot, you know, a lot can be learned about you. They will use information that they've collected about you that you've signed into their terms of service. And uh, they will find people who look like the, those who the campaign wants to target. And we know that these messages are sometimes targeted at vulnerable people and sometimes contain uh, at least arguably misinformation or disinformation. And I believe that you could have a law, a privacy law, that says that um, while campaigns can target whoever they want, social media companies cannot use the data that they have collected from you uh, in order to find other people right, and target those people who have not requested or have not interacted with the campaigns uh, with their ads. The issue turns on, I think, the question of whether this data collection is a kind of First Amendment protected activity. And I know that First Amendment scholars are very divided on this question. And one of the problems with what I'm uh, proposing, uh, it, it gets a little bit into the weeds, is that I'm proposing a law that bans micro-targeting only of political ads and not of other kinds of ads, like an ad for like, to sell couches or something like that. And then that raises another problem, which is that it's a content specific speech uh, and that might run afoul of a, of a case involving robocallers that the Supreme Court decided last term. So I'm not, I, I'm not at all confident that the current Supreme Court would uphold it. Although I think that a proper understanding of the first amendment should allow um, the upholding of that law. And I should just add, I think that the Supreme Court's jurisprudence is based upon a, a, a marketplace of ideas approach. The idea that counter speech is always the best solution, that the truth will rise to the top. I think we need a recognition today that that's not always true, that speech is not always going to rise to the top, and that there really are dangers for voters, and voters need some protection from misinformation and disinformation. I wonder, though, I never bought the marketplace of ideas metaphor. I've always thought that the basis for protecting free speech is much more distrust of government power. And I wonder, in terms of what you just said, whether a court would be willing to allow the government to restrict political ads while allowing commercial ads 
since political ads were always thought so much more to be at the core of what free speech is about. And of course, nothing would stop the sending of the political ads to all the voters in the district or all the voters in the state. It's about whether they're going to be targeted. And so we do know that campaigns will speak out of both sides of their mouth and target one message to one set of people and one to another. I say it's like the difference between using a photograph to uh, target someone and using a mind reading machine. People don't recognize how much they give up in terms of their privacy when they sign on to these social media services and that they can be targeted and manipulated in this way. But I agree, it's a very difficult constitutional question. Let me go to another reform that you proposed, which is about disclosing algorithms. This is talked about a lot with regard to reforms with regard to social media. Could you explain what you mean by this and why you believe it would be beneficial? So an algorithm is just a fancy name for a computer program that tells, tells a, a, a program what to do. So uh, let me give a, another example from uh, my uh, cheap speech book. Uh, there was a time in October of, um, I think it was in October of 2020, where if you went onto Instagram and you did a search for Joe Biden on Instagram, some of the things that would be returned, uh, you know, as an, in the search would be positive information about Donald Trump. But if you went onto Instagram at the same time, and Instagram is owned by Meta, the same company that owns Facebook, you go onto um, Instagram and you search for Donald Trump, you did not get positive statements about, uh, uh, positive links to uh, stories about Joe Biden. And Meta explained that this was a technical glitch. They weren't trying to do this, but nothing in the law would stop them from doing this. And even more than social media, what about search? Think about Google's dominant position in the search market. What if Google decided we like one candidate for president, we dislike the other? You could easily imagine the algorithm being programmed to give positive returns for one candidate and negative returns for the other. Now, I don't think the government has any ability to say to a private company like Google or Meta, you've got to favor both candidates even handedly. And, and we can talk about that. Uh, point later, because I know that you and I have somewhat of a disagreement on this. But I do think that you could say disclose. So if there is reason to believe that you are, uh, as, a, as a, a search company or a social media company, having biased results, then you would have to disclose that you are engaging in this, or you'd have to give at least the ability, not publicly, but uh, for government uh, investigators to be able to look and see if the algorithm has been programmed in this way. And then if it has been, that information is simply reported. And so people know it. Again, as with my other solutions, most of my solutions are about providing voters with more information. So if an algorithm is being manipulated in a particular way, and all algorithms make choices, but if it's being done in a way that favors one candidate or disfavors another, then that information one way or other should be disclosed to voters. So they know, okay, if you're going to this website, you can expect to get some biased results. Again, let me ask a First Amendment question. Would requiring the disclosure of the algorithms be a form of compelled speech that would violate the First Amendment? We can't ask a newspaper to disclose why it chooses something to be in the headlines and something else to be on page 25. Isn't requiring disclosure of the algorithms asking the same thing of social media companies? Well, first of all, I don't think we would have public disclosure. So in terms of trade secrets or, or how business is being done, I don't think it would be uh, the, the same thing. With a newspaper, it's, very, it's much easier to tell whether a newspaper is favoring one candidate or another because everything that you see is what you get. And if something is on page 25, you already know it. Whereas you would not know necessarily that the searches that are being returned are not going to be the same. It, it was amazing to me to see that if my wife and I will do the same search on Google, we will not necessarily get back the same results because the algorithm is being programmed to give different people different results. So I do think that you, uh, you um, can do this. Uh, and if it's not publicly disclosed, I don't think that it runs into the compelled speech problem. Let me ask one overall question, then go to the questions that we received from the YouTube chat. The central problem I see you talking about in this book is the false speech that's so easy to occur because it's cheap speech. And yet, as I go through your solutions, I wonder how many really deal with false speech. The election administration proposal is an important one. Disclosure is an important one. Um, prohibiting micro-targeting, disclosing algorithms, 
Do they really get to the underlying problem of false speech because it's cheap speech? So even though my book has the subtitle about disinformation, it's not only about disinformation. So for example, one of the big problems I talk about, and we don't have time to talk about in this book, is that with the demise of local newspapers, we have much more of a risk of corruption. Because it turns out when local newspapers are not around to be the watchdogs, uh, then corruption can flourish. And there's some very good economic studies about newspapers closing and being newspapers being far away from state capitals that this happens. So uh, yes, you're right. Uh, much of the problems that make it harder for voters to make good decisions and that make it harder for uh, our democracy to flourish are not just about misinformation and disinformation. As I said earlier, there are many problems caused by cheap speech. And I'm not saying that that uh, the problems outweigh the benefits, but we should target all of those problems. Uh, today, I think because of Donald Trump, so much of our conversation is about disinformation in elections, but there are lots of other problems. I think if we did not have Trump, the conversation would be somewhat different. Many of the problems would still be the same. After all, I was worried about the risk of violence in our elections before Donald Trump came on the scene. Uh, you know, uh, our, our uh, social media and, and the information environment didn't create our polarization, but it certainly has provided more fuel for the fire. I have so many more questions that I want to ask, but we started to get questions in through YouTube chat. I again, want to encourage the listeners to send their questions in. Rick, let me pose to you some of the questions that we've gotten from listeners. The first is, what do you think about social media companies limiting content related to elections? Are you saying that is okay? So I, except for the two categories I mentioned, which are empirically verifiable false speech about when, where, and how to vote, lying to people about how to exercise their franchise, and certain foreign uh, campaign activity, I don't think that we can have mandated content limitations from the government, the government saying you can't print this. I think that would run, you know, especially, or when if you're right, that the First Amendment is about distrust of government. Just imagine the president you like the least getting to appoint the speech star who decides what speech is allowed and what speech is not allowed. Very, very dangerous. But that doesn't mean we can't have social pressure to come onto the companies. And so let me talk about something very specific and, and also bring back in uh, the question of law and the Supreme Court. So on January 6th, we had the insurrection at the Capitol. On January 7th, Twitter and Facebook, both private companies, decided that they were going to remove uh, Donald Trump from the platform. This is so-called deplatforming. Private decision. I think it was the right decision. I think that these companies, the private companies, they have a social responsibility. There should be a huge thumb on the scale in favor of including politicians, even those with odious ideas. But at some point, they cross the line. If you advocate violence or if you make a uh, repeated statements that undermine the legitimacy of an election process without any evidence, I think it's a good decision for these private companies to make to remove uh, a, a candidate like a Donald Trump. And Facebook is gonna have to decide next year whether to reinstate him because their oversight board said, uh, you need to put a time limit on it. So they said two years and we'll come back and revisit. And I think social pressure, that's a non-legal response is a good way to go. But Florida and Texas, both states that support, uh, that have Republican governments that, that voted for Donald Trump have passed laws that would require social media companies to include content from politicians that they don't want to include. And I was, I have to say, somewhat shocked when I saw that Justice Clarence Thomas of the Supreme Court, one of the most conservative justices on the court who on matters of speech has generally been quite a libertarian, believing that you can have uh, um, unlimited undisclosed money in elections has taken the view that such laws are in fact constitutional, agreeing with some tentative ideas of Professor Volokh, the, the professor who coined the term cheap speech. They argue that social media companies are like telephone companies. They just allow people to communicate and don't communicate themselves. So Verizon can't say, we don't like your politics, we're not giving you a phone. I think that's a false analogy. I think that Social media companies, even though federal law, a federal law called the Communications Decency Act doesn't treat them as publishers, are in fact making publication decisions. They're making editorial decisions like newspapers. Those algorithms tell the, tell, um, the computers which content to promote, 
which content to demote. If we didn't have moderation of content, imagine what um, our social media feeds would look like. They'd be filled with hate speech and pornography and uh, pictures we wouldn't want to see. We want content moderation. The idea that Justice Thomas would endorse a law that would require a private company to carry speech seems to me to be turning the First Amendment on its head. It's the government telling you what message you as a private company need to do. Now, on the flip side of this, and this goes back to the algorithm point about what if Google starts favoring one candidate and opposing another, that's a real danger. Platforms make a lot of decisions that are very important in terms of what we see and how we make decisions. But if they are too powerful, the solution is antitrust law. Break them up rather than speech codes that tell them what they have to include or don't have to include. Let me ask you another question again from someone in the audience. How do you think social media companies have addressed information so far? So one thing I say at the very beginning of Cheap Speech is that my book is really na narrowly limited to the issue of elections. And so I don't take on things like COVID vaccine misinformation or um, how um, social media affects children, teenagers and their self-esteem. Uh, and, you know, uh, the use of non-consensual sexual images, so-called revenge porn. So there are a lot of issues. Now, I can't really say that. But in terms of elections, uh, I think they've done a terrible job. First, we had the situation where when Trump was making these false claims of the election being stolen, Facebook and Twitter experimented with labels. Uh, this claim is disputed or learn more about elections. And we know from some social science studies that those labels didn't convince voters that the, that the speech was potentially false. They might have even inadvertently gave the, given the speech more prominence and gotten it more attention. Then fast forward to um, after, you know, um, dur during the 2020 election, after the 2016 election, when the platforms were criticized for allowing all kinds of information about um, hacked emails from uh, the Democratic Party that influenced the 2016 elections, there was a story about Hunter Biden and his laptop that appeared in the New York Post. It wasn't clear if the story was true or not, if the laptop was actually legitimate. Um, but Facebook and Twitter made what I consider to be the wrong decision to remove the content or demote the content. Again, they're private companies, they can do what they want, but I think that was an overreaction to what happened in 2016. And therefore voters were deprived of potentially reliable information. We didn't know if it was false or not. It turns out that the laptop information, at least some of it, according to reporting in the New York Times just in the last month, likely was true. And so I think social media companies are trying to find this balance. I, I criticize them, but I don't claim that it's easy. They got into the business of trying to have friends communicate with each other. And now they're in the business of you know, are they encouraging genocide in different countries? It's become a very difficult problem, but it's also a very profitable business. It's a very important part of society today. And um, I guess it's both Spider-Man and Justice Kagan who said, with great power comes great responsibility. The next question that we got from someone who's watching focuses on your point about elections and integrity of election administration. It says, should open source election machine software be required for transparency, even though it costs massive costs to replace proprietary software? Can that be done legally? So there's a huge dispute, and I'm only on the periphery of it because I'm not a technologist, about whether open source software is the best way to produce election machinery, right? On the one hand, if it's open source, then you can have outside people confirm that the voting machines are not being manipulated. On the other hand, if it's open source, you might provide new ways for hacking because people can kind of see under the hood, figure out how the thing works and looks for, look for a solution. So I don't have a, a, a well-informed opinion about that, but I do have two related opinions. One I've already given you, every voting machine should produce a piece of paper because then you can assure that uh, the the, the uh, piece of paper can be counted by hand and we don't have to rely on potentially manipulated machine uh, counts. The other thing is that uh, social scientists have recommended what's called a risk limiting audit. It's a certain kind of audit that is done, not the kind of fake audit that we saw with the cyber ninjas looking for bamboo in the papers as we saw in Arizona after the election to try to 
bolster Trump's false claims of the election being stolen. But this is what election administrators do, taking a statistical sampling of ballots to make sure that the announced totals match what the machines and ballots show. And that sort of process, as well as transparency in elections, is the best way to assure both that we have fair election administration and that we have election administration that people can believe in. I, I don't know about looking under the hood, but there's plenty on top of the hood that could be made more transparent and that could help to bolster people's confidence in elections. The next question from someone who's watching, transparency of super PACs and dark money groups, how hard will that be? So we talked a little bit about a related issue before, which is that um, the Supreme Court has long said that disclosure of those who are spending money uh, and contributing to uh, elections for office can be subject to disclosure laws. You have to have an exemption for people who face a realistic threat of being harassed. But these disclosure laws are constitutional for three reasons. They uh, prevent corruption, because you can look for deals between the contributor and the beneficiary. Providing voters with valuable information. Voters will sometimes use information about who's paying for an ad to figure out if they support it or oppose it. If I tell you that, that a ballot measure in California is supported by the National Rifle Association and opposed by Planned Parenthood, I bet you can figure out how to vote, even if I don't tell you anything about the content of that uh, initiative. We rely on this information to uh, make decisions. And it can allow for enforcement of other laws, like the ban on foreign spending. The problem with disclosure, at least putting aside the Bonta case, which suggests the court is now getting skeptical about, about disclosure, the problem with disclosure on the federal level has not been uh, that there's a constitutional problem. It's been that the laws have been written in a very um, uh, loophole-laden uh, way. So it's very easy through super PACs and through other groups to get around the disclosure rules. That can be fixed. And there are a few bills that have proposed to fix it. It's not just about super PACs, it's about all kinds of groups that are spending money trying to influence elections. It's definitely a solvable problem. And until maybe two or three years ago, I would have said no problem with the Supreme Court to uphold such disclosure laws because it would just be a natural extension of what the court, at least since 1976 in the Buckley versus Vallejo decision has said is justified. Today, though, I am concerned uh, in part because the Supreme Court has changed. Uh, Justice uh, Kennedy, Justice Ginsburg, Justice Breyer, Justice Scalia, these were all very strong votes in favor of disclosure. Justice Kennedy and Justice Scalia, Republican appointed conservative justices, Justice Breyer and Ginsburg, more liberal, uh, Democratic appointed justices. There was consensus on this issue and no longer there's consensus. Uh, by the end of the term, Justice Breyer will be gone. Uh, it's not clear to me that there's still a majority that has the same commitment. And we know at least two of the justices, the justices um, Thomas and Alito, have expressed great reservations about campaign disclosure laws. And in the Bonta case, I think we can add some of the other conservative justices as well. The next question, and this to me really goes to the heart of your book, is, is there any way to combat disinformation from Fox News? You're focusing uh, the cheap speech that goes on on the internet, but what about Fox News and the misinformation that they put forth? Well, so I do try to say that my uh, concerns about cheap speech extend beyond the internet also to cable news and uh, all other ways in which people get information today that they didn't get 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, there's a feedback loop. So, you know, so how do you deal with these problems? Just like I think we can't have a law that says that Facebook must include certain content or has to be even handed. I would say the same thing about Fox News. You can't have a law that says, you know, Fox don't lie on TV. Um, so uh, how do we deal with this situation? Well, one way that we see uh, that this is being dealt with is through defamation laws, which I discuss in the book as well. Uh, Fox is now being sued uh, along with One American News Network, as well as uh, Newsmax and uh, Rudy Giuliani and uh, Sidney Powell, lawyers who represented Donald Trump, uh, who all of whom uh, are alleged to have made false claims about voting machines being manipulated. In, in one case, by, somehow by the dead Hugo Chavez. I did, I, the theories are so outlandish uh, in this election that you know I just don't even understand all of them. Um, defamation is a way when there is a lie 
and it is a lie that injures someone's reputation, you can get damages. Now, the Supreme Court said back in 1964 in a case called New York Times versus Sullivan, that because of the constitutional risks of chilling speech, the standard for a defamation claim against a public official, government official, and then later extended to, to all public figures is very high. You have to prove that the statement was made with actual malice, meaning that the statement was knowingly false or made with reckless disregards to whether it was true or false. And I think that is a very hard standard to meet. I think it might be met at least against some of the defendants in these cases. And I think that's a good way to police at least some false information only gets to, again, lies that damage someone's reputation, but it is a partial tool. I was also surprised to see Justice Thomas, who we talked about earlier, who I'd considered, I think you and I have talked about this before, how much of a free speech protector he's been in the past, but somewhat inconsistent. But in a case called Berisha uh, versus Lawson last year, uh, Justice Thomas, as well as Justice Gorsuch, Neil Gorsuch, one of the newer members of, of the court, uh, suggested that um, the libel laws perhaps should be loosened, echoing Donald Trump, making it easier to sue. Now you might say, well, that's a really good solution for someone who's concerned about disinformation, which was precisely the point that uh, Neil Gorsuch, Justice Gorsuch made in his uh, concurring opinion saying we should take on this issue. But I'm concerned again about government tyranny and the concern if you make it too easy to sue, uh, for public officials to sue, then you're going to really chill news media going after those public officials in an aggressive way like they need to do to serve as a check on those officials in our democracy. So while I think defamation is a good tool, I like the compromise that the Supreme Court crafted back in the 1960s, one which is currently under pressure that would require uh, this, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the change that, that Thomas and Gorsuch are talking to would make it much easier to for defamation that maybe benefits misinformation, but maybe chills too much speech. I know, Erwin, this is, I know, something you studied. I, I know I, I shouldn't turn the tables, but I wonder where you stand on this question. Um, gotcha. I had a question to ask you. Well, let me ask you my question, then I'll answer your question. Okay. The follow-up question I wanted to ask you is, you invoke New York Times versus Sullivan. There, as you know, the Supreme Court said, there has to be constitutional protection for false speech so there's the breathing space for speech to survive. The Supreme Court in subsequent cases has stressed the protection of false speech. Given how much your book is concerned about false speech, should we reconsider that premise of New York Times versus Sullivan? I, I don't think so, because I think on that particular point, the Supreme Court has evolved in its thinking about false speech. I'm thinking of a case from 2012 called the United States versus Alvarez, which is a, a very speech protective case. It's about a guy who lied about having won a congressional medal. And the court, in a kind of divided opinion, said uh, that um, uh, that this law couldn't be enforced against uh, the, this uh, this person. But along the way, the court said a lot of interesting things. And one of those was um, there's certain kinds of false speech where, the, where there is a compelling government interest in allowing it to be proscribed. So, for example, laws against perjury. So if you get up on the stand, you take an oath to tell the truth and you lie. It's hard to do, but if it's proven that you've lied, you can be subject to criminal prosecution. And Justice Kennedy, I believe it was, in the Alvarez case said, it's so important to protect the integrity of the judicial process and related uh, law enforcement purposes, that if someone's going to lie like that, we can prosecute them for this. So that is punishing someone for false speech. Uh, fraud, right? So if if someone defrauds another person and, and takes their money, you know, you defraud, um, you know, an elderly person of their life savings, we allow that to be prosecuted. We don't allow the person to say free speech or blackmail, right? There's all kinds of speech that we say that speech is not protected. Um, so the First Amendment is not absolute. It's not just about uh, yelling fire in a, in a movie theater, it, it goes much broader. And so the claims I make about certain kinds of false speech, like lying about when, where, and how people vote, is that there's a compelling interest there too. But remember, most of what I'm, uh, 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 to limit that speech, but remember most of my, what I'm trying to do is provide more speech, whether that is disclosure of information, labeling of deep fakes uh, as altered, most of what I'm doing is giving voters more disclosure of algorithms, giving voters more information to make informed decisions. And in answer to the question posed to me, I think New York Times versus Sullivan got it exactly right. 
the premise of New York Times versus Sullivan is there has to be open and robust debate about those who hold and run for public office. And I think in order to protect that, we need a standard like New York Times versus Sullivan that limits defamation liability. So I think on this issue, you and I are very much in agreement. Let me try in our last minutes to get two more questions in. The first is, how would you recommend including information about disinformation, misinformation, and critical thinking skills in schools? I mean, about high school levels and above. Is it being taught? So this is kind of like, here's another area where I'm not an expert. Uh, well, I'm not a, an expert on, on education and digital literacy, but I have read what those experts say, and it is being taught. And I think it's, there's a really interesting dichotomy uh, on the basis of age right now. So older people turn out to be more likely to share false election-related disinformation than young people, uh, in part because they're, I think, less discriminating. And when they see something, they are more likely to believe it. So the problem with, with, with um, older people on social media is that they might be more li likely to be taken in by the speech. With younger people, there's a different problem, which is they are flooded with so much misinformation that they discount all information. And they, you know, they, they don't believe anything. And so that itself is problematic. What we need to do is teach um, uh, young people how to decide when something is reliable information. I remember when my kids were going to school, you know, it was like, don't rely on Wikipedia. You know, you have to do your own research. Now today, Wikipedia is actually one of the more reliable sources online. But I, I offer a specific suggestion in the book. So I say, uh, you know, in, uh, in this, uh, to help with this uh, digital literacy, I say that journalistic societies should set up voluntary seals of approval, right? So like a good housekeeping seal of approval, they should say, if you abide, again, this is private, not government. If you abide by these rules that journalists accept as, as uh, required, morally required, like you have to get two sources, you have to give the person you're writing about a chance to respond, then you get the seal of approval. And then that seal of approval could voluntarily be put up by the social media companies next to the, the name, you know, so Los Angeles Times has a little icon say, okay, this is a source that generally can be trusted. So I think if we have that, and let's say that Breitbart comes in and asks for the seal of approval, and we have a debate about that, I think that itself would be edifying about how journalists do their job and what it means to abide by objective journalistic norms. I like the next question is one to end on. And it's one that really gives you the chance to restate your overall thesis. It's where do you draw the line about elections and election related, I think that should be speech, about when to step in to protect truth and when not to? This is the really hard question. You know, when, who should get involved and when? And because of the concerns about the First Amendment, it's a very difficult question. So we have a commitment both to robust campaigns and robust speech about politics and other things, and a commitment to democracy, a place where people will be able to vote. And as the Supreme Court has long recognized, that voters will be able to be informed, right? And informed citizenry, the Supreme Court said, is a, is a compelling interest that the government has, making sure that voters are, are aware of what's going on and can make decisions consistent with their own values and interests. So how do you balance the two? With those very narrow exceptions we talked about, I don't think the solution is uh, speech policing by government. I don't favor return to the fairness doctrine. I don't think we can go back to, I don't think we'd say to Facebook, you need to present even handedness, or we're going to have a government bureaucrat that's going to decide that or not. But there are many things that the government can do, like require the production of additional information. Who's behind the messages you receive? Is the video that you're watching one that has been altered to make it look like a politician is doing something embarrassing? Or is this a genuine uh, video? But beyond that, it's not just the government's responsibility to deal with this problem. That's why in the last part of cheap speech, I say that there's a lot that all of us can do. It's about creating not just these journalistic norms, and it's not just about social media companies being pressured by their uh, customers and their employees to do the right thing. It's about finding a way to balance uh, uh, these concerns while still having a respect for science, the scientific process, and the rule of law, and democracy. And that is a multi-year project. I think it requires 
finding people who can come to the center say, we disagree about issues about taxes or abortion or about immigration, but we agree we should have a fair election system where all eligible voters and only eligible voters should be able to cast a ballot that should be fairly and accurately counted. We agree that people shouldn't lie about elections being stolen. Uh, we agree that voters should be able to have access to information to make informed decisions. And we agree that science is a process. It's not just there is a truth, but the very act of communicating helps us to figure out what the truth is. And so we need to have an open, robust democracy where people can discuss issues. But we also have to recognize that in this new information environment, we face big challenges about how to assure that voters continue to get that information. So we need to come together, support those intermediaries that help us to tell the truth. We have just a few minutes left and I wanted to leave them for you to deliver your thesis to the audience. Or if there's anything I didn't ask you about that you most wanted to say about the book, what concluding thoughts do you wanna leave the audience with? Well, I think we've hit on the main themes of the book that um, cheap speech, the era of cheap speech is, has been a mixed blessing for the United States and for the world. Uh, that it is good that voters and, and people have access not only to, to more information, but that voters can express themselves. But it creates a challenge for our democracy. It creates a challenge in terms of getting voters the information they need and having faith in our elections. You know, there's something political scientists refer to as loser's consent. It's the idea that um, to have a democracy those who are on the wrong end of the election, you know, the, my candidate didn't win, grumble about it, but they agree the election was fair and square. And they say, all right, we'll live through this next period. And in the next election, we'll try again. When you don't have loser's consent, when people don't believe that the system is being fairly run, then your whole democracy is at risk. And so I wrote Cheap Speech worrying about the risks to our democracy. In the course of writing Cheap Speech, I became even more worried about those risks. But I do think that rather than end on a note of despair, I, I, I'm gonna end on a note of vigilance. There's stuff that we can do. Uh, there's stuff that we can do in the private sector because the First Amendment limits what could be done by the government. And because even if there wasn't a First Amendment, as I say in cheap speech, we wouldn't want a government speech czar telling us what we can say and what we can't say. And so the future is really in our hands. It's a very delicate moment for American democracy, but is one in which I think we need to do our best to assure that we continue to have the dual commitment to robust speech and to free and fair elections. It's a wonderful place to end this conversation. The premise of your book is that the internet and social media have dramatically changed the very nature of free speech. I think they're the most important developments regarding free speech since the development of the printing press centuries ago. And I think you do a very nuanced job of explaining there are benefits to that, but there's costs. And we need to find ways of dealing with the cost. One of the great things about this book is the detailed proposals that you make for change. So I would very much encourage everyone to get the book. It's called Cheap Speech, How Disinformation Poisons Our Politics and How to Cure It. It's written by Richard Hassan. Um, I want to thank my dear friend Rick for giving me the opportunity for this conversation. I want to thank the Commonwealth Club for inviting us. And I thank all of you for joining us. I'm Erwin Chemerinsky, and it's truly been a pleasure to be part of the conversation. Thank you, Erwin. I really appreciate the conversation.